Joanna Schwartz, who is a, uh, a law professor at UCLA, and the book is called Shielded, How the Police Became Untouchable. Uh, Joanna, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. So uh, you open your book in Atlanta uh, in the introduction, and that's been in the news for cop-related, police-related reasons recently because of the construction of Cop City, the uh, the the demonstrations and, and the, the protest against it. Um, and you tell the story of Henri Norris, who was a 78-year-old grandfather who had this encounter with police. It was not a lethal encounter, right? But still a hor- horrifying one. Why did you make the, the choice to start with that story as opposed to, you know, some of the more well-known, uh, infamous stories of police brutality uh, in this country? I actually fill my book with stories of people who you likely have not heard of before. And that is for a reason. Uh, The cases that garner national and international attention are cases where there's a lot of public pressure uh, to get justice for the victims of misconduct. And in those cases, often justice of some sort is is quickly uh, given to the, the victims and their families. But the place uh, the, the kinds of cases that I'm really focused on are the cases that don't get public attention. And those really are the cases where the various kinds of barriers that the Supreme Court and state and local governments have uh, created uh, that make it very difficult for those people to seek justice. And so I start the story with with one of those people. Uh, his name is Henri Norris. As you mentioned, he was sitting at home watching the news uh, as he did most nights when a group of over a dozen police officers stormed into his home. They were looking for a drug dealer and had a warrant for a house that was uh, 30 yards away and looked nothing like his home. But they came into his home anyway, busted down the doors, uh, handcuffed him, put him to the floor, ignored his uh, calls for help. He had uh, heart trouble and, uh, and, he was double the age of the person they were looking for, but uh, was mistreated nonetheless. And when he wanted justice through the system, there was no chance that uh, the officers were going to be prosecuted. They weren't they weren't disciplined by the department. And so really the kind of justice that he could get was through a civil suit seeking money against the officers who had broken into his home and scared him to death. Well, and and the problem, and I apologies if you hear this construction in the background. I can't tell if that's getting picked up, but um, I don't hear it. okay, good. Um, well, I mean, you know, so what ended up kind of preventing him from from getting justice? I mean, it's 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 qualified immunity. I know a lot of people in our audience have probably heard that term, but what is qualified immunity? Qualified immunity is what closed the courthouse doors for Henri Norris. And it's a legal protection for officers, even when they have violated the constitution, if they haven't violated what's referred to by the Supreme Court as clearly established law. And I talk in the book about the development of qualified immunity over the years since it was first announced by the Supreme Court in 1967. The protections have gotten stronger and stronger with each passing year, such that Today, even when an officer has violated the Constitution, they are protected so long as there's not a prior court decision from the Supreme Court or a court of appeals holding that virtually identical conduct is unconstitutional. And in Henri Norris's case, there actually was a prior court decision that had very similar facts where officers had gone without a warrant into someone's home and then held that person at gunpoint. In that prior case, the court did say that the conduct was unconstitutional. But in Henri Norris's case, they still dismissed his claims against the officers because the decision in that prior case was unpublished, meaning it exists uh, online. It's something that I have read and others have read, but it's not formally published in the law books. And so according to uh, that court's rules, uh, 
the unpublished decision couldn't clearly establish the law. So he was denied relief. And as one additional layer of injustice, Henri Norris's case, the decision in Henri Norris's case wasn't published either. So the law is clearly, it's still not clearly established in that in that area. Well, well, let's go through the history then of some of the case law that led us to this point, right? Because, I mean, your book is very much focused on the power of civil litigation and what that could mean for, for policing in this country. Um, but we don't have that because of a current standard that was set I mean, it, there's a, a lot of focus on that the case Monell uh, versus Department of Social Services, but it really started much earlier than that with something called Section 1983 in the Ku Klux Klan Act birthed out of Reconstruction, which is a topic that we, we cover a lot on this show. Um, take us through that history, uh, if you don't mind. Sure. It's a really interesting and important history, I think, in context to understand where we are today. Uh, in the Reconstruction after the Civil War, Congress enacted what they referred to as the Ku Klux Klan Act, also sometimes referred to as the Civil Rights Act, which was intended to provide a ability to sue for constitutional violations in federal court. And it was inspired by the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and other white uh, supremacist groups that were torturing and killing Black Americans with uh, law enforcement officers either participating in the violence or standing idly by. And the notion was that there needed to be a federal forum, a place, a federal court uh, case that could be brought. At the time, in many state courts, Black uh, people were not even allowed to testify. So it was hardly uh, likely that they were going to get justice through the state system. And so when that law was enacted in 1871, uh, the Ku Klux Klan Act, which then became referred to as Section 1983 for the place where it sits in the United States Code, uh, that held the promise of providing justice for people whose rights have been violated. But very quickly, the Supreme Court uh, issued a number of decisions that essentially made Section 1983 powerless, and claims were very rarely brought and never successful uh, in almost the next century. It wasn't until 1961, uh, in a case called Monroe versus Pape, that the Supreme Court first recognized that uh, people could sue government officials, in that case, police officers, for violating the Constitution. And then it wasn't until 1978 when the Supreme Court ruled that local governments, under a case called Monell, local governments could also be sued for the constitutional violations of their officers. So, I mean, the, that that period after the passage of the Civil Rights Act and then the kind of immediate blowback due to, you know, the, the, the failure to see reconstruction through and the Supreme Court becoming radicalized. Right. I mean, it, they uh, what Plessy is how many 20 years, 25 years after after that, um, where, you know, uh, upholding the legality of, of segregation. I mean. How quick was that turnaround and that uh, attempt to, to limit civil rights uh, in the wake of the Civil War, uh, particularly when it came to, you know, the ability of, of black people who would experience a civil rights violation to get recourse in any any way? It was rapid and it was uh, really a, a series of Supreme Court decisions that limited the interpretation of the 14th Amendment, limited uh, the kinds of uh, violations, constitutional violations that could be remedied through the statute. As you mentioned with Plessy versus Ferguson, the Supreme Court essentially authorized uh, uh, segregation and discrimination. Uh, and so it was a, a pretty quick turn. Um, then in the, the 1910s, teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, there became uh, sort of the growth of what became the civil rights movement, pressure back on governments and, and back on the Supreme Court to take a firmer stand, um, which they ultimately did as far as Section 1983 was concerned in 
1961. But then in the years following the recognition that Section 1983 could be used to vindicate constitutional rights, the Supreme Court really stepped back from uh, that those protections again, almost almost mirroring what they did following passage of the Ku Klux Klan Act during Reconstruction. And in decision after decision, the Supreme Court cut away at the ability to vindicate people's constitutional rights through Section 1983 with doctrines like qualified immunity and many others. And one, an important point I try to make in the book is, although a lot of attention recently has been on qualified immunity, there really are a whole host of protections that prevent people from getting justice in the courts. Uh, I want to turn to the the 60s and, and the uh, the reaffirmation and then the rollback. But I, I really loved also your your emphasis in the book on what policing was like during, say, you know, the the 19th uh, and 20th centuries, but really the 19th century as well, like how these southern police squads were really just came out of of slave patrols. And then in, in places like Texas, um, Texas Rangers uh, being the, the, the groups that eventually became policing organizations um, responsible for killing indigenous people, Mexicans, um, and, and just, you know, how you can't understand policing, especially in that part of the country, although, of course, it's racist throughout the country, without understanding how these organizations came to be out of literally the most racist kind of gangs of people that there could be in those regions. Absolutely. And I think understanding where we are today as a country also requires looking to the past and looking to uh, the inception of, of law enforcement. And I think it's, uh, it's an interesting and important story to know that there is not just one uh, one creation story for law enforcement in our country. It really did come from a variety of, of different um, uh, parts of the country. It, law enforcement uh, arose in, in different ways. As you mentioned, in the South, it was slave patrols. Uh, in, the, in the Southwest, uh, in Texas, it was the Texas Rangers. In the North, um, the the New York Police Department was really modeled on the Metropolitan Police Department in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, but with those different origin stories, I think that you can still see a, a theme, which is uh, that law enforcement, no matter where it began in our country, um, has been given a great deal of authority to uh, impose their power on the most powerless uh, in our society. Um, Black people in the South, uh, indigenous and Mexican and Mexican Americans in the in Texas and and the surrounding regions. In the North, it was immigrants, uh, it was laborers, and so it, in in the country, uh, de, no matter no matter where uh, you look. Policing has really been marked with subjugation, uh, racial subjugation and subjugation of the least powerful. How much of this, too, is the fact that our Constitution and it's all all its infinite wisdom uh, never really had uh, federal um, protections or uh, I'm not sure the word I'm looking for, but like a, a statute on um policing federally. It was essentially left to states and municipalities. I mean, is that, as somebody who's a, a legal scholar and, and a law professor, is that one of the things that you see as hamstringing our ability to, to curb police brutality from a federal level? I do think that the intense localization of law enforcement uh, creates a lot of problems. And if you look at policing across the country, there's almost 18,000 law enforcement agencies, many of whom just have one, two, three uh, officers. And uh, there's very little uh, federal oversight, little requirement uh, that there be um, any data collected about policing uh, and provided to the federal government. We saw 
in recent years uh, that the federal government doesn't even have good data about the number of people killed by police each year uh, and far less information about other kinds of misconduct in which officers engage. There are limited requirements for accrediting officers, limited uh, requirements for um, educating them, training them, disciplining them, uh, limited standards for when officers can be decertified so that they can't uh, hold a law enforcement job anywhere. And these are all areas where I think uh, a greater federal presence would be would be valuable, would be useful. But it is an area that uh, the federal government has been reluctant to intervene in. And as a matter of constitutional structure, uh, there are difficulties in the federal government trying to impose those regulations uh, because it's really not something that's that's recognized in the Constitution. There have been efforts by tying federal funding to those kinds of improvements that have been considered and were considered as part of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Uh, but I do think more federal control uh, would would improve our system somewhat. So, so let's turn to uh, the the standard that you were kind of dis uh, discussing earlier, the Monroe v. Pape case in, in 1961, and then the the kind of chipping away at the the attempt at at, at bringing back some sort of ability for uh, people to to get recourse uh, from police. Um, take us through how the modern standard that we apply to these um the, the these issues of police brutality kind of happened in in supreme court case law absolutely so there there are a number of different ways in which the supreme court's decisions have chipped away at that right to sue uh one of those is qualified immunity doctrine which uh protects uh, officers even when they have violated the constitution if they can't if there isn't a prior court decision with nearly identical facts, and that has gotten a lot of attention. But there are other Supreme Court decisions that have a large impact as well. Uh, consider the Supreme Court's decisions that just interpret what the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution means. That is a protection against unreasonable searches and seizures. But the way in which the Supreme Court has interpreted that language of the Fourth Amendment, police can stop and frisk um, someone walking down the street, stop their car uh, and search their car for for really almost no reason at all. Uh, the court has described there needs to be a reasonable suspicion, but the way in which they've interpreted it uh, allows that officers can, can make those stops on a pretext based on race, based on ethnicity, so long as they can come up with a justification afterward uh, for the stop itself. Um, there's similar uh, latitude given to police when it comes to use of force. Police can uh, shoot someone, assault someone uh, who has done nothing wrong, who does not have a weapon, even, even uh, who is holding their hands up in the air so long as the officer says after the fact, I feared for my life. If they have a uh, reasonable concern uh, that force is going to be used against them, they can use force themselves. And it's so, these standards are so vague uh, that it really does give police tremendous power. Uh, I talk in the book about eleven different uh, protections, but I guess I'll, I'll say I'll, I'll, I'll offer one more, which is uh, protections against local governments um, in the private sector employers are directly responsible for their employees' misconduct. But the Supreme Court has said that local governments are not directly responsible, that they can only be sued for a pattern or practice of constitutional violations. And the court has made that standard very difficult to meet. So even in extremely troubled police departments, like the one I profile in Vallejo, California, mm. uh, where officers have bent badges in celebration of police shootings and no officers uh, have been disciplined or terminated for their conduct, courts still have found that the city of Vallejo uh, is not or cannot be held responsible because the plaintiffs cannot prove a pattern of past 
constitutional violations. That's incredible because the amount of violations that you detail in your book, um, I mean, you just gave an anecdote there, but if you don't mind just speaking about Vallejo in particular, because that's such an extreme example of what you're talking about. It is an extreme example, and it's a, a small-ish city uh, near Oakland, California, with about 120,000 people and about 100 officers. And I really focus on the period between 2010 and 2020. Uh, during that decade, police officers in Vallejo killed more people per capita than all but uh, one St. Louis of the 100 largest jurisdictions in the country. And uh, I looked at lawsuits filed during that period of time. I came up with 85 of them. And again and again, you hear or read stories by people who had egregious force uh, against them after they had been arrested, when they were handcuffed, uh, they were tased and they were beaten, they were kicked. Uh, I focus on a story of a man named Mario Romero who was killed uh, by a police officer in Vallejo after his car was stopped, uh, allegedly because the car looked like uh, another car that had been involved with a crime. Mario Romero hadn't been involved in any crime, but uh, he was shot more than 30 times in his car. And in fact, one of the officers uh, had to reload his weapon, got up on the hood of the car and continued shooting Mario Romero. And Jesus. Mario was one of three people that that same officer killed in a matter of months in 2012. And yet when the family of Mario Romero brought this lawsuit against the city of Vallejo, alleging that they had a pattern of horrific misconduct, I should say this officer not only wasn't disciplined, he was promoted uh, and then left the department after a few years to run his own police training uh, business. Oh, that's good. <laughs> but well, uh, I'm sorry. I just like that. He's standing on the hood of the car like he's in Grand Theft Auto and he's, you know, make, he thinks he's he's like the Punisher or something like that. And he has his own training, training uh, apparatus. I mean, this is why it's it's not just training, it's like defunding and then also the ability to, to actually have civil, civil litigation. I just have to say that. That's that's what makes this is this is so systemic, but but I apologize. Keep and going. And it is, no, it's it it is systemic. And and it is important to see this not just as a problem of that officer who clearly was acting in a way that would be unimaginable to many law enforcement officers uh, e even, uh, but it was a product of a larger culture of the department where officers could get a celebratory badge bending uh, ritual after fatally shooting someone and no one was disciplined. This is a problem that goes not to the individual officers or not alone to the individual officers, but to the entire city, the jurisdiction. And this is why it's so important to be able to bring cases directly against the city, to hold the city responsible for the department that it funds. And even though all of these cases, so many cases had been brought, 85 by my count in a decade against this department, and a small group of judges were hearing all of these cases, um, it was still not enough under the law that the Supreme Court has uh, authored. It was not enough to hold the city responsible because the plaintiff couldn't prove that the prior shootings were unconstitutional. So there wasn't a pattern of prior unconstitutional conduct that would put the police chief on notice that he needed to do something different. I, so in terms of municipal liability, right? I mean, is there any credibility to the claims that municipalities wouldn't have the deep, the deep enough pockets to withstand these lawsuits? Pretty sure the answer is no. Um, I mean, in the Breonna Taylor case, I mean, was that different? Because I know that her family did get a settlement. Um, but but uh, if you don't mind, uh, yeah, expanding on that. Yeah, so there are a lot of large settlements and judgments that we hear about um, in the news. Um, and when those settlements are uh, against a smaller 
jurisdiction, um, you know, it will eat up a larger part of that jurisdiction's budget. Um, or more likely in, in really smaller jurisdictions, it will be an insurance provider that, that provides uh, the payouts in those cases. But in the vast majority of cases, particularly cases that, that, uh, that don't um, get that kind of public attention, the settlements and judgments are much smaller. And in cities and, and counties across the country that I studied, I found that payouts in these cases tend to amount to less than 1% of local government's budgets. And, and usually it is the local government's budget, not the police department's budget um, that is being affected by these payouts. And if you compare uh, this less than 1% in police misconduct payouts to the quarter or third of uh, local government budgets that are spent on the police department's budget as a whole, uh, I think it's really misguided to criticize payouts in police misconduct suits as potentially bankrupting jurisdictions when they really are a very small piece of the pie. And especially when there are many people whose rights are violated, who get no vindication in the courts at right. all because of limitations like qualified immunity, among others. Yeah, that was really more of a devil's advocate uh, question. Um, lastly here, I, I, is there value in your eyes in, you know, not trying to, I guess, circumvent municipal liability to make it just like siloed to a police department? Because say the municipality or the state or whatever, that gives them some sort of skin in the game of systemic overall haul for police as opposed to maybe some potential kind of uh, statutory carve out? I do think that uh, part of the challenge is figuring out where the best pressure points are, where the pressure points are for change. When it comes to who should pay in police misconduct suits, I, I actually don't think it should be the officer. I, I do think that there are there are statutes like Colorado has experimented with requiring officers who've acted in bad faith to pay a portion of a settlement, $25,000 or 5% of a settlement or judgment. I actually think that's a good idea because it does give the officers some skin in the game while also making sure that the local government is going to be able to fully compensate the person whose rights have been violated. My inclination is that police departments should have the money taken out of their budgets. And remember, police departments' budgets are set during city budget planning processes. Right. So it's, it's really money from the city that goes to the police department's budget. Um, but I've spoken to uh, risk managers and officials in some jurisdictions that do this. And they have said that knowing what is being spent and knowing that it's coming from their budget does make police departments uh, a little more sensitive to the decisions that they're making. It's still just a small, small percentage of police departments' budgets, um, but they are directly able to make some changes if they choose to reduce the likelihood of future harms. Well, uh, this was so excellent. I can't thank you enough. Joanna Schwartz, professor of law at the UCLA School of Law, author of Shielded, How the Police Became Untouchable. We will put a link uh, to the book in the description, uh, podcast, YouTube, all those good places. Uh, thanks so much, jo uh, Joanna. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Of course.